morning. How are you? Good. Got your snacks ready to go. We can be here for a while, can't we? We just sung Revive Us Again. Praise God this morning. That means we're dead this morning. God, would you revive us, Lord, today in this place? What a time and opportunity to be in the house of God today. I count it a privilege and honor to be here today. There's a lot of places we could be, ain't there? But we're here in the house of God this morning. Thank God. And that's this morning we're going to talk about but then. But then. And I want to read to you. You ready? Yeah. Okay, good. Here we go. In the book of Acts this morning, we're going to go through Acts a little bit here, but Acts 7 and verse 58, the Bible says, And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And I'm going to ask you this morning, do you know who Saul is? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Well, you're smart. So... <laughs> Saul was a man um, here at the time of, you know, a little after Jesus. But this is a man that was, knew who he was. With a surety in his mind, he knew exactly who he was. He was a Pharisee, a Pharisee, he said. Uh, he was a learned man. He has head just full of knowledge. And lots of times we'll get our head plumb full of knowledge, but the problem is it don't get down here to the heart where it can do some good. You see what I'm saying? Well, he was a man that uh, he had... Uh, Wondered, I wondered this morning, maybe you have, but you know, Christ came to him after his crucifixion, right? And I wondered if Paul's age and how he was, had he been, you know, amongst the Pharisees when he was learning all this stuff and, you know, uh, teach this stuff that he'd been learning. I wonder if he'd heard about Jesus, you know, because I mean, I figure people talk, don't the preacher? I mean, people are going to talk about things going on. They'll do that. Yeah. So I wondered if he'd heard something about Christ, but you know, it obviously hadn't penetrated his heart, had he? Uh, he kept right on learning. Well, then we find him. Uh, he had a zeal here, you see, for work. You see, he had a zeal to do something for God, didn't he? He felt like his heart. And here he stood as Stephen was being stoned. And Stephen, bless his heart, had just preached to them their very history and the very, about Christ. That's all. He, and they're sitting here, their ears stopped up, and they just don't want to hear it. So they're going to stone him. And there he stood at the feet. And there he stood with the clothes of those that getting ready to Rear back and throw that rock at him, you see. They had to get this word to throw good. So they laid his clothes down at his feet and he stood there and watched it go on. Saul. So Stephen, his whole, the whole point of Stephen was to, you know, shut him up. We're not going to list this preaching. We don't want to hear this no more. We're going to hush him up. Maybe it was a threat to the other ones around, you know, the ones talking about Jesus. But it didn't have that effect, son. It scattered them about. It scattered the Christians Abroad, and you know what they're doing when they're out there scattered? Is preaching and is witnessing, telling about Jesus. God's will will be accomplished. God's will will be done. Amen. Amen. So here we find this man. Now he's on a, a, a six day, about a six day, 130 mile journey to Damascus, and he's breathing threats and he's talking slander, talking about slaughter. I mean, he's. He's upset here. He's going to go get them Christians. And I'm going to get them, and I'm going to bring them back to Jerusalem. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bind them up and bring them back. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm doing. In his mind, I feel like he thought he's doing it for the glory of God. But then, but then, I thank God this morning for a but then moment in my life. Had I not had a but then moment where I met Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I'd still be lost in sin this morning. And I hope this morning, every one of us, I hope you've had a good one of these days, you get you a but then moment. You can say the same thing, can't you? I had a but then moment. But listen, but then, uh, the, the, but then, a light shined brighter than the sun. The S-O-N shined brighter than the S-U-N created sun in the middle of the day and Jesus Christ appeared unto Paul. And then this man... This man, this old learned man, he knowed all this stuff and he knowed all the Bible. He knowed it, didn't he? But he's asked this question. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And this learned man then, what he had to say, he had a question in his heart, didn't he? He said, Lord, he said, Lord, who art thou? We need to get there, don't we? Lord, who are you? Lord, who are you? And this man that had known who he was, this man that 
was spiritually blind on his way to Damascus. Uh, this man then now is physically blind, still headed to Damascus, but they're heading to lead him by his hand. You see, he left out spiritually blind, but physically, but he took his sight from him, but he was spiritually blind. Eyes were open on that road, but he was still going to Damascus. That didn't stop. But this reason he's going to Damascus, it went from I'm going to go get him and I'm going to bring him back to where he's coming for physical hearing in his eyes. And not only that, start the ministry of which God's called him to do. But he's still going. He's still going. So listen, I want to ask you this morning, well, why do we wrestle with God? See, Paul was kicking against pricks. He was wrestling against God, wasn't he? Sure was. And, and I'd say this morning, when we wrestle with God, uh, it's going to leave a mark in our life, ain't it? You can ask Jacob what happened to him when he was wrestling with God. He limped the rest of his life. You can ask Jonah this morning. Jonah said, I ain't going to go. I'm going to wrestle with God. You see, and he got to take the first submarine ride right in the belly of a whale. Did he? But God's wills will be accomplished. It will be accomplished. Listen, I'd ask you this morning, why don't we just cling to Jesus? Why don't we just cling? Instead of wrestling, why don't we just cling to him this morning? Knowing who he is in our life. And listen this morning. Uh, listen this morning. He, we got to listen. Talking about surrendering sometimes. I got to thinking about surrendering. And you know, if somebody says, I surrendered, you know, that means you lost, right? Oh, no. When we surrender to God, we've won, you see, this morning. And listen this morning. When the, uh, we got to be lost to be found, don't we? You don't know you, you can be found till you've been lost. And listen then. When broken, you got to be broken to be healed. And you got to be weak to be made strong. You got to be. And Paul learned then who he was. He thought he knew who he was, but he didn't know who he was. But now he knew who he was. And he was going to preach, and he was going to teach, and he was going to plant churches, and he was going to go, and he's going to suffer, and he's going to die for the cause of Christ. That's who Paul was. That's who he became from Saul. He wrote this of himself. Put up First Timothy for me, uh, fifteen, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundantly with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. You want to ask, did Paul know who he was? I expect he did, didn't he? He learned that he's the chief of sinners. We all better feel that way. We all better feel that way. And I'm almost done and you've been so good. Listen to me this morning. It ain't important this morning, really, to your salvation. Do you know, if you know Paul, it's really not important, your salvation. But he left, he left, listen here, an example, the pattern here that we ought to follow of how he came to know Christ. And we ought to look at the example of how he came to know Jesus Christ. That's important. But it's not important this morning either. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are this morning? I hope you know who you are this morning. But what's important this morning that you know and come to know is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. God's will be done. God's will be done this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you. Did you like that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you did. Them, them little things are smelling good over them goldfish. You going to share with me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God, we're going to pray this morning. We got prayer request. Children's church. Children's church. Bible school. <laughs> how about Preacher Jeff this morning? Yep, how about that? How about the church? How about the needs? God's gracious. He's merciful this morning. He loves us. I appreciate you guys so much this morning. I really do. Let's pray. Ready? Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, God. We want to thank you, God, for the honor, honor, Lord, to be here in your household this morning. And praying, Lord, today, Father, that if somebody don't know who they are in Christ this morning, God, would this be the day you'd speak to their heart, God. Lord, for that but then moment, Lord, we pray that today. Praying for Brother Jeff, God, just to help him to be uh, preached in a way to be pleasing you. God, give him that he stands in need of, Lord, and uh, help him to just clearly proclaim the gospel of Jesus this very day. God, we do pray for Bible school. We pray for children's church and pray for each one of these young people, their fathers, mothers, grandmothers, grandmothers, grandfathers. God, I pray that you'll bless them and encourage them, God, as they work in their lives. God, we pray now, uh, Lord, for your many needs that's within the church. God, you know them. 
And we pray, Lord, today that you might move in a way to be pleasing, God, to you. And help us, Lord, as a church to keep our eyes focused upon thee. And we're going to praise you and give you the praise and honor and glory. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. And amen.
that song, thank you. Because that's one of my favorites. And the closer I get to glory, it becomes even more favorite. How about you? I, uh, I've got a, a nice home down on uh, what's called 48 Cornerstone Drive. That is uh, in the Lyledale community. Uh, where I was born and raised, and uh, I guess to this world standard, it's a pretty nice place, a dwelling place. Uh, but uh, I'm going to a home one of these days that the chief architect was the one who made the world. And he, he said it like this, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Don't get much more personal than that. I hear a lot of stuff about custom work. Some of you are in that business. You, you do custom work. Well, custom work in the etymologies, that's the root word. The, we get custom, we get our word customer. And if you don't have someone who's going to pick it up or enjoy it, then really all that hard work's for nothing. And I say that this morning to say this, Jesus has went to prepare a place for you. And what I say in that is that are you ready to meet him? I can say without all any doubt, whatsoever, that I'm ready to meet him. And it's not because I'm a Baptist, but it's because I'm born again, washed in the blood of Jesus. And my peace calling and election has been made sure by the Spirit of God taking his word and making it real in my life. You say, preacher, you sound like you're perfect. Absolutely not. Go back there and talk to the three that I rolled in with this morning. They'll shake their head and say, a lot of impurities in that man. But I am glad I'm saved this morning by the grace of God. I'm interested in some verses found in the Gospel of John chapter 4, and it's a very familiar text to us this morning, something that... We've heard all of our life, probably this passage there, up there with the Great Commission about how God has commissioned us, has sent us out to do the work. I, with you this morning, Jesus does the work. He does the work through us. But we are the hands of the feet, and the mouthpiece of the church, the body of Christ. I've got spirit in me, but I don't have enough spirit in me to think that that piano is just going to start playing. That's, that's mysticism. God's got to get her sister or somebody up here to make them keys tingle our ears and tickle our ears. I, there again... I like when the Spirit of God gets on that. But for me to think that, you know, the song's just going to sing their self, that's not going to happen. The Bible this morning is not going to read itself. The church house isn't going to be full this morning by itself. It takes you and I as the body of Christ to fill it, to play it, to read it, to sing it, and more than anything, worship the head, which is Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want you to begin reading with me, please, this morning in verse number 34. John chapter 4. Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. That's important. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. 
Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. What both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. When Jesus looked over these fields, I'm probably aware that he was not a We know that his father, his earthly father, was a carpenter by trade, but there's no doubt he he knew something about the agricultural arts. He knew when something was ripe for the picking. Me being raised at my granny's house, even though a lot of the stuff I didn't eat, I mean, I'm in that liberal generation where I've got a tomato on one hand and I've got a can of chocolate pudding on the other. I'm sorry, old timers, I'm going with the chocolate pudding. Because we didn't really get it that often and when we got it, it was a treat. We could have maters all the time. But my point is, my granny could send me out and in my limited, uh, limited mind, my my limited ability, I still could look at a tomato and tell when it was time for the picking. Well, Jesus here, again, probably having more of an extensive or an exhaustive knowledge of it, and of course, seeing that he created it all anyway, knows it. He makes three profound statements here that I want to deal with this morning concerning these fields being white or ripe. And notice that word, already to harvest. In verse number 34, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I think there's something there I want to look at for a little while concerning Jesus' sole purpose. I know many of us here today and a lot of our Pentecostal brothers and sisters said that Jesus came to give us the gift of tongues. Jesus came to give us the unspeakable gift. Jesus done a lot of things, but I I, I want you to understand he did that, but more than anything, Jesus came to do the will of his Father. Jesus come to do the will of his Father. What was that will? What what was the sole purpose Jesus is acknowledging here to these people, to these disciples? And he wants them to know crystal clear, clearly uncut, please know why I'm here. I did not come to open the blinded eyes. I did not come to feed you. I didn't even come to heal your cancers or your leprosy. He said, I came to do the will of my Father. And the will of my Father was to do exactly what Brother Estep said this morning in our Sunday school lesson, to bring back, to reconcile back to God from man to God our fallen condition, our sinful ways, our sinful doing. And God on the cross did exactly for us what God the Father sent him to do and what me and I needed him to do on our behalf. He saved us from our sins. Now, glory to God, I'm here to tell you this morning, that may not do anything for you, but I want to tell you, praise God, it still does something for this old boy. To know that God has ransomed me from the fall, that his sole purpose, understand this, as great of a man as he was, as great of a teacher as he was, as great of a God that he was, Jesus' sole purpose was to come for you and for me. And you may be here this morning and you don't feel too special. There's some days I get up, I don't feel really that special, do you? I'm not, my my fan club's not over rolling. I'm the president of my own fan club. 
and I don't get a whole lot of fan mail and yada, yada, yada and all this good stuff, but I want to tell you somebody who does love me this morning and somebody that makes me feel like the only sinner in the world and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. If I was the only one, hear me out this morning, Church of the Living God, if I was the only sinner this morning, if I was the only one that had born into this world, Jesus would have come and died for me and me alone. How much more special can that make you feel this morning? Brother, I thank God when you did sing Mansion Over the Hilltop. All of that's because of him. All of that's been made, made uh, that, Lord God, those are fringe benefits. Those are just extended benefits that we're going to receive. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You youngins, that's still the plan of salvation this morning. That's still the way we get in today. We don't get in through good works. We don't get in through turning over a leaf. We don't get in through being baptized and joining the church. We are born again into the family of God. And Jesus makes it very clear. Notice those words. He says, my meat. I'm going to speak a little country here this morning if I can. I know we've got some, probably got some vegans out here. Is that how you say that? That word just scares me saying it. Vegan. Sounds like a, some kind of vampire or something. I know it's not, but it's just strange. And, and if you are, listen, I'm not here criticizing that, but I'm going to tell you something. If I sat down at a, at, a, at a meal and ate some kind of slab of meat there, honey, what would we come for? Huh? I mean, even the gravy's got some sausage cut up in it. Come on, preacher. I mean, a little side meat. I mean, even growing up at Granny's house, if it was fat back, praise God, it was meat. And it was good. Meat's that whole proportion. It meat, meat's that thing that I, I know these sides, that everybody likes the taters and the bread too. Oh, praise God, preacher, hurry up. We got something good at the house. And the longer the sermon, the harder it is we're going to get through. Well, just hang on a little bit. I still got two more points, baby. The meat. Meat is what gives the person strength. Meat is protein. Meat is what feeds our body the energy that we need. And that's what Jesus is saying. My meat, my sole purpose, the reason that I'm here is to do the will of the Father. I wonder... This morning, if we could say that as God's people. Is it our meat? Is this why we're here? Are we here today? We're just here to hear this preacher. We, 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 we've got a variety, and we want to see which one's which, and this and yuck and everything else. We heard you last week. We thought we'd just go ahead and come back and see if you could do it any better this week. That's not our meat. That's not why we're here. Our meat today is to worship in spirit. And in truth, our meat today is, is in all of these opportunities. I, I see these things coming up about Bible school. God bless you. Get out here, knock on doors, invite people, print flyers, do whatever you got to do to get them in, to get them in, to get them in, to hear what? To hear you teach, to hear somebody preach? No, to hear about the man from Galilee who can deliver them from their sins. That's the meat. That's the sole purpose. And brothers and sisters, that's what we need to be about. Secondly, in verse number 35, there's a sudden placement. Say not ye. Listen to this. Say, don't say this. There are yet four months. It's amazing that my first conversation, my first real intimate conversation this morning uh, was with uh, a gentleman here to my left that... that uh, works in, uh, brother, tell me what you do. That's how bad that is, ain't it? We've done for God. Orchard. Orchard. That's just a fancy word for trees in a field. <laughs> Orchard. And I asked him about the season. And this is one clue he told me. And I, again, I'm just an old country boy that knows enough about, I know where to spray the roundup and where not to spray the roundup. But he said this. He said, so far... In February, we've been okay. 
Now, I don't think much changes on this side of the, of the mountain on Moravian Falls than the mountain on the other side. I don't think a whole lot changed. Still got that old clay soil. Still got them good red delicious and them yellow ones and all them good apples. But I do know this on the other side of the mountain. This is what they're scared of. All this warm weather and you start seeing these buds come out on these trees. Boy, ain't it pretty. Ain't springtime just like, it's just like resurrection all over again. What they don't need is to see a heavy frost come in and kill them. Now I got, am I right, brother? You can back me up right there. You had to correct me last Sunday, but I'm on, I'm on point today. I said, my God, we might need to get him up here. We don't need him as a preacher. Maybe we come up here and he can help tend the flock a little bit up here on the mountain. Got enough sense to know that it's all about timing. Again, I don't know exactly exhaustively how much Jesus had gathered wheat or corn and, and probably he had and of course him being God, he knew all that. But the sudden placement here is not so much about Jesus as it is about his disciples and he says, yet there are four months and then cometh the harvest. I want to talk about that for just a few minutes. I want to talk about these four month Christians. Four months, preacher. I'm going to get on fire for God and I'm going to go out here and I'm going to do this. Did you know that procrastinating Christians are some of the worst Christians? Can I say that? Putting things off is one of the worst things you can develop in your life, especially in the spiritual realm. And this is the truth be known. I don't know if I'm going to be here in four months. I am not know if I'm going to be here in four weeks, four days, four hours, four minutes. That's how fragile our life is today. And brothers and sisters, what Jesus is telling us here in this sudden placement is that we better be about doing the work of the Father and not next week, not next month, not next year, but right now. Now, I'm sure as I'm standing in this pulpit that there is somebody that God is running by, has run by, will run by before you go home today. You said to yourself, I need to go see that old boy. I need to go see that gal. I need to go see that family. There's a family that used to attend here. They no longer attended here. What happened, we really don't know. We've heard rumors. We've heard this. I'm going to tell you what, best thing I know to do is just go down to their house, sit on their porch face to face, and tell them you love them, you miss them, and you'd love to see them back at Bethany Baptist Church. See, that's what he's telling us. He's telling us time is of the now. Time is of the essence. We better get busy doing what God would have us to do because notice what he says. Behold, I say unto you, verse 35, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white or our country word ripe and already to the harvest. You see, that's the thing about Christianity that I have to get to here before I move to my third and last point. Paul said it kind of like this. Paul said we all have a part. I know there's people right now sitting on a pew here in Bethany Baptist Church and you say, preacher, me being here is not important. I contribute absolutely nothing. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong because you're here today. Your presence encouraged someone. Your presence helped someone along the journey. Sunday school teacher, I know how it works, especially with youngins. You go in, it takes you 15 minutes to get them corralled, and 15 minutes later, you've taught and you've lost them somewhere along the line. I've taught young people a lot for a long time. I know how that works. But there's always your present that's key when those young people grow older and you know what they're going to say. Hey, I remember her. 
I remember him. I remember such and such. And you know where they were at Sunday morning? They were in their pew at their place, at their spot, doing their job. And that has an impact on people. Now, I get to all that to say this. Everyone has a part. Paul said it like this. Paul, myself, he wrote, I planted. Brother T. Paul, I don't know who it was, but somebody planted those trees up in your orchard whether it was you or somebody before or whoever, somebody planted. Here's the second point. Paul said it like this, Apollos watered. You know, I'm glad that the good Lord sends the rains on us, don't you? But sometimes in his divine wisdom, he holds it back. And we don't always get the rain we need, so... He gives us these uh, sprinkler systems, whatever, to water your plants, especially those that are in the house. You may have not have planted it. You may not even be the one that waters it. You, hopefully you're in that work area somewhere. But here's the key to the text. God gives the increase. God gives the increase. You could go out here and buy the best of land, the most fertile crest you can give. God gave them that over there in Israel. And you could plant the choice vines. You remember the book of Isaiah, he talked about the wild vines. He said, that's not the ones I used. He said, I went after and I got the choice vines. And he said, I planted those. I watered those. He even went on to say, I fenced them in so the little foxes couldn't come in and eat the grapes. I tended them. But do you know what? On the best and worst day, it still takes the touch of God to bring forth the fruit. It does. Something in the soil, something in the atmosphere, something in the water, Something in the fertilizer. It's something that God takes and uses all of these factors in order to give the increase. And friend, I'll tell you this again. I don't know how he does it, <laughs> but I just know he does it. And I am so grateful and I am so thankful that he does. My sole purpose, my sudden placement, but thirdly and lastly this morning, I want you to notice my sure payment. Verse 36, and he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth shall rejoice together. Again, I go back to a Sunday school class years ago at Lyledown Baptist Church. I was probably about seven Eight years old, it was before my mom and dad split up. And I remember sitting in there, and uh, our church, they always met, open assembly, and they uh, uh, would sing, and, and somebody, the superintendent would get up and, and talk about the lesson, and then they would dismiss and come downstairs. And there'd be about eight of us boys down there. And at that point, we were young enough and dumb enough to think sitting up on the back of those old wooden chairs cocked up like this, we thought we was cool. We was till about four of us fell one day and bopped our back of our head on that concrete wall. And the teacher looked at us and said, I told you not to do that, and you did it anyway. But I think about those men. I think about Roy Gregg. Years later, I'd, I'd pastor his, son, his grandson and his, and his granddaughter-in-law and I'd, his great-granddaughter. He dead in glory. But I still remember him every Sunday. Getting up teaching every other Sunday. Him and Creel Little. And I'll be honest with you, looking back, he probably wasn't the best Sunday school teacher. 
but he taught us the word and that was good enough. Sometimes you don't always feel like you're the best Sunday school teacher. Sometimes you don't always feel like you're the best singer. Sometimes you don't always feel like you're the best preacher, but it's amazing God's letting you do it. He's entrusted you with it. And I remember Brother Step, he'd always get up at the end of his lesson and he said, I'm sorry it's been scattered. He said, but it's the best I could give you with what God's given me. And I've never forgot that. I've never forgot people like Don, Ru Don Rudisel. Later on in life, I'd go up to Little River and I'd pastor her sister for 27 and a half years. And she would always work with the young people. Never, was, never had any children. Never had any children. And she was so active with our young people. Loved them. Sung with them, taught them, worked in vacation Bible school. There's another thing. It's coming up, and you probably already decided whether you're going to be a part of it or not a part of it. Let me tell you something. The fields are white and ready for harvest. Well, preacher, we've done been to every door in this, on this mountain. Every door. Every door. Come on, Chuck. I, I, I'd say surely you're extending that. You're just a little bit maybe. Because I want to tell you, there's always another door. There's always another family. Did you know in Wilkes County, just like it is in Alexander County, we think everybody goes to church, everybody's in Sunday school, everybody's been baptized, and everybody carries a King James Bible. That's not the way it works. For years, I worked in the Bible club at Sugarloaf Elementary, and there was thousands. Of all the years I did it, there was literally thousands of little boys and little girls they didn't have a Bible, didn't go to Sunday school, and didn't even know what church was all about. That's why the church moves out of the four walls of this beautiful building. It goes out into the highways and into the hedges and compels them to come in. My daughter is here with me today. She still works with the Bible club, takes kids from class to class, and she'll come in sometimes and she'll say this, Dad, they were rough today. They wasn't listening today. I said, Emma Kate, I said, I know that. But for every five or ten that don't listen, there's always that one that's listening. And that's the one we're after. That's the one we're after. You see, Bethany Baptist Church up here on the top of the mountain in Welch County, the fields are ripe. They're ripe. I know they're fixing to get ripe over here on the mountain at the orchard. I know they're fixing to get ripe over here at these, this place we come up by, come up by there on the left. I know it's going to get ripe here in about two months. Spring times are coming. And that's when a lot of the hard work will really begin. But when the harvest time code us, notice, he that reaped and he that sowed were rewarded. My daddy's Bible, I promise I'll close. My daddy's Bible, I got it for Christmas the year he died. He always had stuff wrote down in the front of it. I'm glad he didn't have his gossip list wrote down in there. I'm glad he didn't have his hit list in there. He had something wrote at the front of his Bible, and it said something like this, and I felt it obliged to write it in the front of mine. He said, working for the Lord down here don't pay too much. He said, but the retirement package is out of this world. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me to heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Church, your field, wherever it might be, is white and ready for harvest. And it needs you to sow, to water, to reap, to tend, to do your part. Brother Hayes, if you'll come with a song of invitation, we're going to stand here, give just a song, just a verse or two. The Lord's spoke to you through this message. I pray that 
you'll move in some way. There's business you need to do with someone, with the Lord, maybe even with yourself. These altars are open this morning as we're staying. Brother, what are we singing today? 359. Number 359. You mind the Lord. advice, we must do the work of him that sent us while it is day. Because the night cometh when no man can work. No man. None of you fine men, none of you fine women, none of you sold out Jesus love and sin hate. Night's coming. Perilous times are upon us. And it's getting down to the wire, brothers and sisters. Are you busy about the master's work? <clears throat> We're busy about a lot of other things. We're busy about our careers. We're busy about our moving forward, making a better life for our family. And I'm one to say here tonight, today I don't have any problem with that. I do not want to stand before God Almighty one day in the judgment and say, Lord, that Sunday morning you were working on me about somebody that I needed to go see and I said I wouldn't go. Their soul and their blood be on my hands simply because I was too stubborn. I don't know about you, but God has a way of breaking stubborn wheel, young man. He can do it. In fact, he can have you to the point, praise God, you're not only going to see that man or that woman, you're going to see their neighbor and their cousin and their friend and everybody else because God's done a work in your life. Be thankful and grateful today that you are one of those laborers, that you are 
one of those that are sowing and reaping and tending. God has given you a field to work so. Again, the challenge is if there's a need in your life this morning, I'd come. Brother Hayes, let's sing one more verse, our, our, our final verse this morning.